We're in a series where we're talking about spiritual warfare, and we're recognizing that at a time like this, the host of evil forces seem to be wanting to come down on the church, that the powers of hell are trying to prevail against the kingdom of God, but are not able to. Pastor Kevin, last week, if you didn't get to listen to his word, it's still available online, and I strongly encourage that you get that, because it's important for us to know that in a time like this, we are at war, we have been called to fight the good fight, and at a time like this, there are certain things that we absolutely need to do. The first thing is that we need to recognize that our God, our Father, is a powerful protector. That also that prayer is a powerful weapon available to us. That truth is a weapon and that the love that God has for us, that He pours into our hearts, the love that He requires us to have for Him, and the love that God wants us to show to each other as we go through life. All of these are powerful, powerful weapons that are really, really necessary. And when I think about such a time as this, I, I want to thank you for, for coming out this morning. I know that it would have been difficult as, as, as you think about it and you, you want to get out of bed and you feel like, Many are cold and few are even frozen, but, but we have been chosen and we need to be here. This is God's will for us in our lives. We come together like this and we're recognizing that if we look into the future and it looks like it's dark or hazy, Sometimes the rear view mirror is a good place. And, and, and as we look there, not because we want to go back, but because we need to be reminded of the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father. There was a time in the history of Israel when the Jewish people were facing the threat of annihilation. And as I think about that time, as I, as, as I talk through that, uh, through the story of Esther, I want us to just draw some principles that are relevant for the season that we're in. And as we look at the world around us, as we're concerned about whatever is happening overseas, we're, we're, we're looking at wars that are taking place, we're looking at legislation that is, going, that is being passed, we're also looking at the end of corona and perhaps a, a monkeypox that might be coming through, and we feel like, why is it that you've just got calamity after calamity after calamity? We need to recognize that this is a time for us as the family of God, as the church of God, to come together and recognize that God is our Father. There was a king by the name of Xerxes in the day of Esther who held a banquet. At the end of six months of boasting, he had a seven-day banquet in which the wine was flowing freely and he was showing people all of the majestic things in his kingdom, all his riches and his power and his glory. And then at the cracks of all of this, he sent his eunuchs to go and call his wife because he wanted to display to all of these people the beauty of his wife to the drunken men who are, who are on the one side. They're having their banquet while Esther and the ladies were having their banquet. And here's the summons and, and Queen Vashti said, no, um, I'm not going to come through. And that created such a problem in the kingdom that they decreed that Vashti will never again appear before King Xerxes. But when all of that was over and King Xerxes realized that he needed to have someone, he needed to have a wife that would be allowed into his presence again, they decided that they needed to look for a replacement. And they, they, they looked to every beautiful young woman in the media, the, the media Persian Empire at that time, and they brought all of the beautiful ladies in. Now, there was a young Jewish girl by the name of Hadassah who was in a destitute situation in the sense that her mom and her dad had died. Don't know the reason, but I know that she's an orphan and she's struggling through this. That her cousin, Mordecai, comes in and he adopts her into his family. He takes care of her and he treats her like his very own daughter. He absolutely loves this girl and wants the best for her. 
and there is a sense of anxiety that on account of Hadassah's beauty, she gets to be taken to be part of the program to see if she is going to be the next king of the, uh, the next queen of the Persian Empire. And as she gets taken into that situation, you've got Mordecai going and sitting at the king's gate, uh, at the palace gate every day. And he's concerned. He wants to know how his cousin is doing and what she needs. And he just wants the absolute best for her. And one of the pieces of advice that he gives to her, he's recognizing that there is so much animosity directed towards Jewish people that he says to her, just keep your national identity a secret. Do not tell anybody that you are Jewish. In fact, change your name. Stop calling yourself a duster. Tell people that your name is Esther from this point forward. But as you think about that, as you think about this individual who has come into her life, who has the heart of a father, who absolutely wants every best thing for Esther. He, he is going to leave his responsibilities and come and sit at the palace gate to watch over her, to do everything in his power to see that she has anything that he can provide for her safety and her well-being. And it's interesting that while he's there, while he's in this place, he hears of an assassination attempt against the king because two of the eunuchs are plotting to kill the king. And, and hearing this, she actually he goes and he tells Esther just, warn the king, and in the warning, he, there's an investigation that takes place, and the people responsible for the plot are actually dealt with, okay? So, they end up dead, unfortunately. But that's, that's the situation. And then you don't hear anything about that story again as time goes forward. But as we're thinking about this, and we're thinking about Mordecai being in this place, just watching over someone and, 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 and having this fatherly, protective heart, this love. We need to recognize that that is exactly the way that God feels about us. And, and it's hard to conceive that God cares about humans, but He does. He absolutely does. In fact, all of life is the proof that God is concerned about us and that He wants a relation, an eternal relationship with each and every one of us. God called a man by the name of Abram. And He calls him out of a family that has turned away from God. They've gone into idolatry. In fact, in Joshua chapter 24, you're... You've got this situation where Joshua is talking to the people just before he dies, the people of Israel. And Joshua said to all of the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and they worshiped other gods. And it's hard to believe that that's the ancestry of the father of our faith, Abraham. His parents his, his, had, had turned away from God. But God called him out of that. And it's, I don't believe that God was only calling Abraham. I think God was calling all people to come back to him. Abraham is the one who listens to God and receives a blessing that comes through obedience. And that's what happens. Then the next word, it's not the next word in sequence, but, but what I want to highlight is in, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, do not be afraid. If I was talking about all of the things that are going on in the world around us, and as we look into the situations that we face, if we have a look at the economy around us, if we have a look at the status of our neighbors and as far as the economic situation is, if it's easy for us to go to that place of fear. When we hear about sicknesses and diseases, it's so easy 
to become afraid. But the problem with fear is that it can paralyze us and that it can keep us from doing what we're supposed to do. Sometimes people are so afraid of dying that they don't know how to live properly. And fear can do that to you. And what's God's call? God is saying more than 103 times throughout the Bible, God is going to just say, fear not. Don't be afraid. What he says to Abram is he says, I am your shield. God is saying to Abraham, Abraham, if you can believe it, and he's the father of our faith, if you can believe it, I will protect you. And sometimes we're looking into the physical and we're not recognizing that the spiritual is so much more important. That God is our spiritual protector. That the warfare that we are engaged in is a spiritual battle, but God is our shield. And He's saying, I will protect you. I am like a father to you. Almost like a picture of a mother hen that's got her wings around her chicks because there's a hawk circling overhead. But the protection is there. She is willing to lay down her life for her chicks. In the same way, that God demonstrates His willingness to lay down His life for us. He has already demonstrated that we need to just continue believing as we go through life that God will do whatever it is in His power that He's able to do, and He's the Almighty. God is going to protect us, and He has demonstrated that. Sometimes we're tempted to leave the realm of His protection, and we expose ourselves to all kinds of dangers. But even in those times when we move out of the realm of protection, God will come out. I love the prophecy that we received today that the shepherd is going to leave the 99 so that no sheep is left behind. That is the heart of our Father God. He is our shepherd. He is our protector. And even if we're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, He is going to go into death itself to conquer death, to show us this is our God the amazing, miracle-working God, and, and, and He's out to protect us. And He wants to take us to a place of rescue. And as we think about that, we think about God as our protector and our need for the protection that comes from God. We also need to recognize that God provides us with certain weapons as we go through spiritual warfare. And I was saying that prayer is a powerful weapon. You know, in the days of Esther, as Esther was in the palace and Mordecai is sitting at the palace gate, there is a man who has been promoted, a man by the name of Haman, who's promoted to being the second most powerful person in the empire. And as he walks through the gates, he notices that Mordecai does not bow down to him or honor him, and it aggravates him beyond what he's able to endure. In fact, he is so aggravated that he decides he's going to kill this man, Mordecai. And when he finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, he doesn't just want to kill Mordecai. He wants to kill every Jewish person in the Persian Empire. And he actually goes and he speaks to the king. He says, there are people in, 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 in your country, in, in, in your empire, who have no respect for you or your laws. We really need to annihilate these people. And the king gives him his ring and he says, write the decree. Issue that decree and destroy these horrible people. And while this is happening and he's got this plot and people get to hear about it. Mordecai hears that it's on account of him not bowing down to Haman that the Jewish people's lives are at threat, that they're going to be annihilated. He sends a message to Esther. He, he goes into mourning in, in, in sackcloth and ashes. He's at the gate, and Esther's like, here's this message. Your uncle, or your cousin rather, is at the gate. He's not dressed well. Send him some clothes, but he refuses to wear the clothes. He's like, Get this message to Esther. The Jewish people are going to be destroyed and you need to speak to the king on our behalf. 
There's a law of the Medes and the Persians that says that nobody is allowed to come into the king's presence unless they have been invited by the king. The only exception is if the king will hold out his scepter to a person who wants to speak to him, that person's life will be, will be spared. And now Mordecai is asking Esther to go into the presence of the king and to plead for the lives of the Jewish people, and she's afraid to do that. She sends message saying that she's afraid to do that. I want us to know that when it feels like all hell can break loose around us, the most important thing that we can do is to turn to God in prayer. And just ask, if, if God has declared that He is our powerful protector, then we need to go to Him and just ask for Him to deliver the protection that we're looking for. What Mordec the message that Mordecai sends to Esther is simple. The Jewish people are God's people. Deliverance from the Jews is going to come. In and he says, deliverance is going to come from someplace. But who knows if it isn't for such a time as this that you have been called to be in the palace. And as Esther thinks about that, in chapter 4 and verse 16, she says, Go and gather all of the Jews in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink anything for three days, night and day, nothing. I and my attendants will fast as you do, and when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And then she says, and if I perish, I perish. And she's, she's, she's thinking about what is important, and she too is willing to lay down her life, put a life on the line for the salvation of the Jewish people. She's going to do whatever she can. Now, it's hard for us to understand why Esther would have this hesitation. Why wouldn't she be willing to think back to relationship? Hey, the, the previous king, uh, sorry, the previous queen has been deposed. She's not on the throne. It was such a process to get her to be the replacement. Her appearing before him isn't going to result in him not handing, holding out the scepter to her. But the, more than that, that she had heard a message that saved the king's life. Why would she think that now if she appears before him, he wouldn't hold out the scepter to her? You know, the, the things that are going through her mind that allows her to believe a lie. And she believes that it is with fear and trepidation that she needs to come into his presence. And as we think about that, and we, we try to understand that, it's, it's, it's more difficult to understand why the people of God don't just flock into His presence when they're faced with dangers or when they're faced with trials or even when they've got joys to celebrate with the Heavenly Father. That, that, that prayer time is such a special time that, that we wonder why is it that people don't pray a whole lot more than we do. When, when we have these meetings and we, and we call for intercessors to come through, we, we're grateful that we've got a group of people on Wednesday evenings who will come together and just spend the time sharing messages that we're hearing from God with each other and praying together because there is this understanding that when you go through hard times and you call on the power of God through the medium of prayer, it changes everything. And we're hearing God saying, you know what? If you will pray more, you will be afraid less. The closer that you are to God and the, the more you recognize who He is, how much He loves you, the power that He yields, we know there is nothing to be afraid of. The worst thing that can happen to a Christian person who goes through life is the best thing that can happen to a Christian person who goes through life. Let, let me say more plainly than that. You know what? When you die, you are going to be with your heavenly Father, and the existence that you have there is so much better than what you're experiencing right now. There is no reason 
for us as Christian people to be afraid of anything. Do not be afraid. And prayer, if I can go back to prayer. In Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 18 to, to 20, Pastor Kevin just, just read this out for us last week, but I, I just want to say it again. It says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. You know, there's the prayer of thanksgiving. There's the prayer of adoration. And there's the prayer of petition where we're asking God for things. And sometimes we just don't even have to speak when we're in God's presence. Just the joy of us being together with the Heavenly Father changes our whole life situation. So let's be that people, the people of God who delight in His presence. Then also he says, and with this in mind, okay, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray also for me. So, so Paul is writing from prison to a, a congregation in Ephesus. And he says, pray for me that whenever I speak, I, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. And he says, pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. You know, the hard times that we experience as we go through life are opportunities for us to demonstrate to the people who are going through life with us that we are confident in the power of our God. It doesn't matter what we face because we know God faces those situations with us, that He is the God who saves and in prayer. Prayer is like worship. It's that medium that just draws us closer. It's not drawing God close to us. It's drawing us closer to God and just being there, recognizing His presence and His power. And I, and I want to declare to every one of us that prayer is a powerful, powerful weapon that God gives us in the spiritual warfare. In the case of Esther, she appeared before Xerxes after the Jews had been praying and fasting for three days. And, and, and she puts on her royal robes and she comes into the outer court and he sees her and he is just so delighted. He, he takes his scepter, he holds it out to her, she comes up to it and, 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 and touches the end of the scepter. And there's this wonderful occasion where, where he's delighted to see her. And she's able to ask him, will you come and have lunch with me? And, and will you and Haman come and have lunch with me? I've got a banquet that I've prepared for you. And, and they go, they have lunch together. And at the lunch, she says, right, I have another banquet prepared for you tomorrow because I need to ask you something. Please come to that. And the king agrees. He, he loves Esther. You, you can't believe how much he loves Esther. And as they leave, you must know that Haman is absolutely elated. He, he thinks that he is the most wonderful human being on the planet as he walks out there because he is the only person other than the king who's been invited to this banquet. And he walks through the palace gate and his bubble bursts because there's Mordecai refusing to bow down to him. And he goes home and he complains bitterly to his family telling them, I'm, I'm so happy that I've been honored by the queen. And, and this man just robs me of all of my joy. And the family gives him this advice. They, they're like, well, why don't you have this gallows built and hang him on it? And he orders it that night. He's like, that's what we're going to do. We're going to murder. We're going to kill. Then I use the word murder. We're going to kill Mordecai tomorrow. I'm going to ask the king's permission. And this is what we're going to do. So they have the gallows built. Now remember we'd been saying that all of the Jews in Susa have been praying. And they've been praying for the well-being of the Jews. And you will believe it, that night King Xerxes is not able to sleep. And it's in the days where you didn't have television, so when you couldn't sleep, you, 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 you called for a reader. Um, and they pull out the... Uh, the chronicles, that's right, the scrolls of, of his reign. And as 
the reader is going through this, he's reminded of something. He's reminded that Mordecai had actually saved his life by exposing a plot against him. That morning, the morning when Haman is walking in to ask for permission to hang, to hang Mordecai on the gallows, the king asks, who's in the hallway? Uh, and they say, well, that's Haman. And he says, bring him here. And Haman comes in. First question, what can the king do for somebody that he would absolutely love to honor? And <laughs> yeah, here's, here's Haman. Oh, your, your majesty, you, you need to dress him in one of your finest robes, put him on your horse, your best horse, and have somebody walk through him throughout the whole town proclaiming this is what is done for the man that the king delights to honor. And then <laughs> King Xerxes says to him, I would like you to do that for him in the Jew, and I want you to be the one walking in front of the horse, <laughs> just declaring this is what the king wants to do for somebody that he would love to honor. Shame that poor man. <laughs> but here's what the Bible says. You know, if you, if you dig a pit for somebody to fall into, you will fall into that pit yourself. But remember the other thing that we were saying. We're saying that prayer is a powerful weapon, that God changes situations that are meant for bad. He turns them into situations that are meant for good. And when, he, when, when Haman goes home and he tells his family what has happened, they tell him something that they should have told him a long time ago. The Jewish people are the people of God. You have gone out against them. Oh, this is the beginning of the end for you. Can, can, can we just remind ourselves that there is not a weapon that has been formed against us that is going to prosper because we have a God. He's our loving Heavenly Father, and we pray to Him. And the other thing that's important is that truth is a powerful weapon. And as we think about that, as we think about truth, it's time for Esther to tell people who she is. So they have this banquet. And the king comes to the banquet, and it's a wonderful meal. And at the end of this, the king is saying to her, Esther, up to half of my kingdom, just ask for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And she says, I, I don't want a whole lot of things. I just want to plead for my life, for myself and for my people, because there has been a decree that, that, that says that we need to be annihilated. And the king can't understand it. He's like, who would do such a horrible thing? And it turns out to be the guest of honor, this vile Haman has done this. We know the story. It's, it's an incredible story. We, uh, I love the way that it proceeds from there. That the Jewish people are given permission by the king to defend themselves. In fact, the king gets to be told that Haman has just issued the building of gallows. And the king says, well, hang him on it because he's wanting to assassinate the queen and all of her people. I mean, the, the future descendants of the Persian Empire are going to be half Jewish. And, and here's this decree against his empire, against his descendants, and it doesn't work. And here's, here's what, we're, what we're drawing from this. You know, as we go out and as we declare who we are and, and we stand in our identity as the children of God, that does something for us. We're declaring that we are God's children, that we are under His protection, that we have a lifestyle that we live that is a lifestyle of power, it is a lifestyle of honor, it is a lifestyle of duty, it is a lifestyle of respect. But we are the people of God. We are the kingdom of the Almighty God. And, and, and the powers of hell will not prevail against this kingdom that we're part of. So let's stand in our identity and let's recognize the value of truth. You know, there's a passage in, in John chapter 8 that helps us to understand the relevance of truth. 
that everything that God stands for is truth and everything that is opposed to what God stands for is a lie. That, that we can actually choose an identity based on how much we respect truth. See, in John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus was talking to the Jewish religious leaders and he said, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. Now, as you think about that, okay, that's an astounding statement. They're struggling with how can the devil possibly be our father? Because as far as they're concerned, Father Abraham is their father. But it's, it's, about, it's about truth. It's about our quest for, our belief in, and our desire to live out truth that determines our spiritual heritage. We have got to be people who pursue truth. And we've got to believe it when it comes our way. He says, you are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. What we need to be thinking about is the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve died. The commandment was, in the day that you eat the fruit of that tree, you will surely die. And yes, there's spiritual death and there's physical death. And spiritually, there was a separation and there was a break in the relationship and there was a spiritual death that took place on that day. And it's because of a belief in a lie. You see, God was saying, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. The devil was saying, you will not die. You will be like God. And they had to choose who they're going to believe. And as we go through life and as our children go through life, they're struggling with that because the school system isn't helping the Christian faith. There is a war against the Christian faith that is taking place in the world around us. And they're getting to believe all kinds of lies, and it's not good. It's important for us as fathers, as families, as mothers, as, as families to, to put the truth out there so that they can believe the truth and have the true identity that comes from having the real faith, faith in what is true, faith in who God is, faith in who we are as the children of God. It is so important. We've got to believe truth. He says when the devil speaks, when the devil lies, he's speaking his vernacular. That's his native language. He is a liar and the father of all lies. And those lies can kill us. But the protection that we have and the weapon that we have is the word of God. The sword of the spirit and the belt of truth and the, the, the sword goes into the sheath. It's just truth being upheld. And the church is the bulwark, the foundation of the truth. And it's God's word. Thy word is truth and we need to believe it and we need to teach it and we need to share it and we need to proclaim it boldly and we need the church praying that we can boldly proclaim it. It's very unpopular. Sometimes what the church teaches is actually called hatred by people who lie. It's called hate speech, but it's the truth of God's word and we need to be bold and we need to be able to stand on truth so that we maintain the identity as children of God. And the other thing that we need to recognize is that love is a powerful weapon, that God wants us to live a life of love, that we want the absolute best for the people that we go through life with. The love that Xerxes had for Esther drove him to the place where he wanted to protect her, protect her, protect her people. But it wasn't just the love that came from Xerxes. It was the love of God for his people that was operating. And he was able to see his people face calamity and then turn to him. And this so often is the case of human history, that these easy times that we go through, are not necessarily good for our faith. That, that, that when life is easy, we find ourselves drifting away from the God who loves us. But we're also finding that sometimes 
when it gets tough, that we remember our Creator and we turn back to Him. And we, what we're remembering Him is the display of the love that He has for us. That, 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 that God loves us and that He wants us to be able to love the people that we go through life with. What happens in the story of Esther is that all of the possessions that used to belong to Haman are given to Esther and Mordecai watches over it. The Jewish people get to protect themselves and they get to celebrate the Feast of Purim after that uh, every year because they're declaring the love of God. In Romans chapter 12, as we think about love, here are the things that God tells us. He says, love must be sincere, that you should hate what is evil and to cling to what is good, that we should be devoted to one another in love and to honor one another above ourselves. He says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. He goes on and he says, be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction and be faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be joyful in what is, uh, sorry, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. And don't take revenge. My dear friends, leave room for the wrath of God. It's written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing so, you will keep burning coals on his head. And don't be overcome by evil. But overcome evil by good. I would like to encourage those of you who are husbands to just love your wives. And if you're a wife, love your husband. I want to encourage if you're a father, the heart of God is to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Just, just love your family and have a heart for each other. Eh, uh, brothers and sisters should love each other. And, and bring back that joy of being a part of a family and the love of a family. Just bring that back into every part of society and culture. Let's live that way. Let's live the life of love that God has called us to. Can I ask the worship team to please come back to the stage? And can I ask you to stand up? In a time like this, when we look at the world and the things that are going on around us, it's easy for us to be people who are afraid of what's going to happen. But God has called us not to be afraid. He's called us to decisive action. God has called us to recognize that He is our Father, that He is a protector. God wants us to pray to Him on a regular basis to keep that relationship strong. God wants us to pursue truth and recognize truth as a weapon and to share truth with the people that we go through life with. And God wants us to love people and to love Him and, 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 and demonstrate our love for Him by the love that we have for each other. Remember also, we are more than conquerors. Yes, we're in a battle, but we've already won. We are more than conquerors through Him who has loved us. I pray that God will just bless you. And if you're online and you're watching, there's a number on your screen that allows you to be adopted into the family of God because God wants you to be His child if you haven't already made that decision. And it's, on, it's all about what you believe. For those of us who are here, if we haven't made that decision to make Jesus Christ the King and the Lord of our lives, to be adopted into the family of a God who loves us and wants to protect us, then it's likely we're going to live a life of fear. But for a time like this, the best thing that we can do 
turn back to God. God bless you in Jesus' name.